The question I'm posing today is can I get addicted to pain? Can anyone get addicted to pain? It's a strange question and something that someone wouldn't necessarily do on purpose. So watch the video to understand a little bit more. Hi, my name is Drew Coverdale. I'm a physiotherapist and author of The Pain Habit. I talk about all things pain and help patients change and let go of their persistent pain. Welcome to the Pain Habit YouTube channel. Click on the subscribe button and you can keep up to date with all things that might help you change your experience of pain. In this video today, we're going to look at that question of can I get addicted to pain? It's a strange question really because who would purposely do that? Well, no one would really want to get addicted to anything. Certainly not pain. And yet addiction to lots of things happens in life and almost any human behavior can become addictive. So I'm going to talk to you about the different elements that might build up to that. And that'll provide a clue that I'll tell you about at the end that can help you reverse the process. So we only do any behavior to get a feeling. And when you're thinking about pain and stress, we all have a default mechanism for the stress that we feel in our life. And that's normally learned in the very early stages of our life before we have any real conscious recollection of it. And that might start with a sensation of stress that is simply defined by something with uncertainty in it, something with a lack of information how to deal with that uncertainty and a sense of loss of control and the person viewing that situation. So it could be practically anything. And in that moment, without certainty, without information, how to deal with it, the child, that point at which they have to learn how to cope with that physiological sensation inside of them that feels uncomfortable, that resistance they feel to that situation, they get a temporary sense of control. Because it doesn't have all of the elements, it'll only ever be temporary. So it tends to be something that triggers the pleasure response in them, takes them to a place of safety. So if I give you a really simple example, so if I was called ginger nut as a kid, I'm pretty okay with that now, by the way, I'm grey. But if I was called that as a kid, that's um, a feeling of uncertainty about why that's happening. It's maybe information about how do I change that perception of what's going on. If I don't have that information, I've got to do something that makes me feel better about myself. That's a response to the stress I'm feeling. And that response might be to fight, might be flight, it might be to freeze or to fawn they're the classic responses that people know i'm someone that would push back against that maybe not fight but run to prove i am better maybe that is fighting actually but i would move getting busy is my kind of response to uh, that situation there might be times when i froze or kind of succumbed as a child but um, we all have these strategies and we have a default so if something you do makes you feel better in a situation where you don't feel good about yourself, that inner feeling, you have to use that behavior. And we all go back to our default one. Until we get to an age or a time of awareness where you can choose different ways to reduce your stress. The problem is that the behavior we develop is unconscious. And if it's destructive, potentially in the longer term, by overusing this pleasure inducing a mechanism or behavior that's where the danger sometimes lies and it's a real big clue as to why people develop persistent pain if at any time in your life you have to repeat that behavior a lot it potentially becomes destructive so pleasure inducing could be things like exercise studying or distracting yourself from something thinking about something but also it can be eating chocolate food it could be some more addictive substances like uh, gambling, drinking, smoking, casual relationships. Now, as children, you shouldn't be doing some of the more illicit things, but you might be observing other people deal with their stress in that way. When they are stressed, they might do those things. So you can experience some of the things as a child as a default, or you can observe them. And if it works to survive the situation, then the child doesn't always have the conscious judgment to determine whether it's good or bad in the longer term they just see it as working in someone else or they just feel it as working in them however if a time in their life appears either 
repeatedly in childhood where they're stressed, they have to use that behavior repeatedly just to get balance. So to feel stressed all the time from the situation they're in, then gets balanced out by overusing a stress reducing behavior that potentially becomes stress inducing. The real stress reducing strategies that we should be using are the things that make us inherently feel good without any effort, love, care, understanding, being listened to, gentle exercise, nourishment, sleep, time with people you love, doing the things that you love. So these come naturally and they're not destructive. You couldn't ever overdo those kind of things. You'd feel fully topped up when you'd done them for a while and then ready to get on with life again. But it's the over-reliance on the stress-inducing behaviors that actually create the problem. The thing is they create a pleasure loop in the brain. It, things that are rewarding or pleasurable release dopamine in the brain. So it's a little neurotransmitter that makes the brain encode what came before that behavior to prompt you to do it again if you feel the same way. So if I give you a real simple example, if you felt bad about yourself or bad about a situation and want to feel better, we all know that chocolate can be quite a pleasurable response. It's only short lived, it's only short term, and actually, when we feel uh, not so good about ourselves, or you want a treat, or you want to get stimulus, we only have to see the chocolate bar, you only have to see the biscuit tin to know what's in there, and your brain releases a little bit of dopamine to make you or compel you to take your lid off and open the wrapper and eat what's in it. It anticipates the sensation. And that's not so bad with all of the things that are short term stress reducing. That's fine to do all of these things in moderation. But if you've become reliant on them, either in childhood for needing them a lot to feel normal, or at a point in your life when you've been very stressed, you've had to overuse it and you've not had access to the other mechanisms, that's where the danger lies. So a point in someone's life where they are so used to using that mechanism, if pain through a physical trauma stops them being able to use it, then they have a craving, craving for that behavior again because of how it makes them feel. The stress from not being able to do it increases the stress that makes them want to do it and quite often they carry on past the pain. If they've done that for a long time in their life, they might have these traits where they're driven and self-sacrificing and do for others and justify all the reasons why they can push past pain. So they consciously justify the craving that they have that's unconscious to carry on those behaviors. So if trauma stops them, that's a dangerous time. Or if there's a stressful time in their life that over days or weeks or months forces them to use these behaviors excessively, you can see how that could potentially cause a problem. If they don't have the balance with the healthier stress reducing strategies, danger comes and pain comes. The earlier signs before pain come, pain's only protection, but only after all the other mechanisms of protection for that organism have been overlooked or ignored or pushed past. Pain simply becomes something to stop that excessive use of the behaviors or the situation creating that pain. Pain in itself starts to become a behavior. And what are the behaviors around pain, whether it's analyzing it, worrying about it, being concerned about it, anticipating it, fearing it, being frustrated about it, being angry about it. There's loads of behaviors around pain that include thoughts, breathing patterns, movements, feelings, they all become unconscious. Once that pattern of behavior wires to emotion, it becomes unconscious. Once it's repeated, normally in the time it takes to recover from pain, when it's either been a traumatic onset or even a gradual onset, those two or three months of taking time out, gentle exercise, getting advice, awareness, care, setting time for yourself, creating boundaries to recover, that should be helping someone recover. They are overridden by the analyzing, the worrying, the pushing past, the carrying on, and it automates those behaviors when they're attached to the stress response. Those things that fire together, wire together, you repeat them enough with a high enough emotional intensity and you automate it. So the brain no longer has to think about doing it. It just has to see a cue and the behavior triggers again. So if pain in its essence is protective 
and it's protecting you from doing the behaviours and the behaviours are protecting you from feeling the emotions driving those behaviours pain just becomes another protection and all the behaviours around it become the addiction it isn't something anybody was consciously aware of doing their conscious reality is pretty much unpleasant the pleasure the brain gets is in a part of the brain where there is no conscious awareness there's a pleasure response the person feels that's very short term but eventually that becomes routine it's been repeated so many times it just feels normal to be at that level so someone might be very stressed for a while they use a stress reducing but stress inducing behavior for so long that just feels normal the organism can't cope with that when that extra grief job loss relationship whatever that trigger is that becomes the tipping point for that person to enter that persistent pain cycle tips the balance their pain becomes this overarching protective mechanism that they continue to fight feel frustrated about angry about the cues that trigger the thoughts the breathing patterns the movements get them to unconsciously repeat the behaviors and simply complete the cycle again so when you see persistent pain as a problem of one of behavior change rather than specific tissue healing of wherever the pain is then it gives you a clue as to how you can reverse the process you have to take tiny bite size steps relating to all of the cues that trigger the pain that awareness is key and amazingly once you have the awareness that it's behavior change you need to work on rather than a fear of a tissue based structure at the source of everything then that shift can make a fundamental change in your experience of pain the physical element always has to be respected it's where the pain is represented so it has to be respected and considered but too much weight given to it with less given to the behaviors around that physical structure and focusing more on changing behaviors and the emotions behind them is the way to reverse the process you can go back in time if you want to find the emotions and maybe the beliefs behind them that led to the behaviors you overused to get to the point of pain that then led to the addictive behaviors around pain but you don't need to having that awareness means that you can start to break down the bonds looking at how you move looking at how you breathe looking at how you think and looking at how you feel and changing them making those changes habitual by attaching them to new emotions rewarding yourself as you do them making the commitment to do it tiny and taking tiny steps in that direction to become pain free so yes you can become addicted to pain if you want to learn a little bit more then dive in read the pain habit book join our facebook group subscribe to these youtube videos or the pain habit blog and just expand your knowledge on this information so it helps you raise questions about your experience of pain and whether you believe that you can start to make changes that can have a real positive effect and take you towards a life of less pain and maybe one that's pain free my name's drew coverdale thanks for watching this video today take a little bit of time out for yourself and plan the next step in your recovery